Good evening. I'm Chris Gagne, board chair at Fairwinds. And on behalf of the board and staff at Fairwinds, we wanna welcome you to an evening with Patrick Kennedy. We have a tremendous agenda for you tonight. The Honorable Patrick J. Kennedy is here to talk about the importance of brain health and addiction, including in particular, his own journey. Following his presentation, we have Kate Brosnan, co-founder of the Nantucket Project, in discussion with Patrick one-on-one -on -one covering issues of importance to all of us. We think this is a very timely and important conversation to be having here on Nantucket. We need to raise our understanding about the prevalence of mental illness and addiction in our community and the need to help those that cannot help themselves. We wanna thank all the people that made this event happen. Thank you to the amazing staff at Fairwinds and the board who worked so hard to put this event together. We want to thank our co-chairs, Abby Perlman and Eileen Shields-West. We also want to thank our sponsors who have given so generously. And I'm just going to list them very quickly. Uh, the Inquirer Mirror, Louisa and Todd Rainwater, Karen Rainwater, Karen and Chris Gagne, Beverly and Dave Barlow, Elizabeth and Michael Galvin, Elaine and Tony Grillo, Lucille Hayes, Barbara Jones, Jill and Stephen Karp, Barbie and Jeff Newman, Linda Taylor, Heidi Cox, Eileen Shields West and Robin West, Mark and Sue Ellen Alderman, Cape Cod Five, Sweeney Construction, the Nantucket County Sheriff's Department, Penny and Alex Neuroth, Maria and George Roach, Janet and Rick Sherland, Toscana Corporation, Atlantic East Real Estate, Congdon and Coleman, Killen Real Estate, the Leibowitz Aberly Foundation, Abby and Steve Perlman, Ann and Phil Smith, Ambassador Elizabeth Bagley, Cohen and Cohen Law, and Ginny and Harry Keeshan. Thank you all for your support. In addition, we want to thank all of you, the audience, for coming here tonight and participating. Thank you. And lastly, we want to thank Patrick and Amy Kennedy for coming to Nantucket and contributing their time and efforts to have this important conversation with us. Uh, before we hand it over to Patrick, I want to introduce to Sandra Dale Berde, our executive director, to spend a minute to tell you a little bit more about Fairwinds and what we do. Thank you so much for being here. As Chris said, my name is Cassandra Dale Berdy, and I'm the executive director of our community's oldest and largest mental health and substance abuse agency on island called Fairwinds Nantucket's Counseling Center. In 1962, our community pulled together their passion and their resources, and they founded our private not-for-profit to ensure, even though we're 30 miles out to sea, that every community member has access to quality clinical care, regardless of language spoken, country of origin, or insurance contract. Since that time, we have remained steadfast in our mission. Over the last 60 years, nationally and throughout the Commonwealth, small rural mental health agencies like ours closed due to the amount of free care they gave or were incorporated by larger monopoly for-profit agencies. Fairwinds weathered that storm, and we are proud to be one of only two behavioral health agencies on island, still owned, still operated by our community after 62 years. Today, we're a beacon of hope for the community we serve, and we're proud to offer clinical services in five different languages, slide all the way down to zero dollars, and ensure we turn no people away. What that looks like in daily practice for us is outpatient talk therapy for individuals, families, siblings, as well as in-home therapy for youth and their caregivers. We meet clients at crossroads where they're struggling with anxiety, 
depression, trauma, grief, just to name a few. Many people in this room may not know that we are also the exclusive provider for child and adult psychiatry, specialized psychological testing, court-ordered addiction services, a mentoring program in our public school for free for 300 kids, as well as newly this year, a walk-in urgent behavioral health clinic. What that means for you is that at 5 p.m. every day, Monday through Friday, and a full day Saturday, people can walk in and see a therapist for free when you need it. This last fiscal year, we served 30,000 appointments, 700 people annually from a team of 39 providers. Who's on our team? We have amazing staff from the second shop, which is our thrift store that underpins some of our free services, a core administration team, paraclinical providers, licensed clinical social workers, mental health counselors, addiction specialists, psychologists, psychiatrists, and a newly important, <laughs> a newly added neurodevelopmental pediatrician to our team. What we believe as a board and a staff is we want to lower stigma, we want to increase help seeking, and we want to offer clinical interventions that make meaningful, lasting changes in people's lives. We also believe in facilitating conversations that matter to our community. It is my great honor to introduce our speaker for this evening. Many of you know the legacy his family has shaped nationally for us with research, parity, advocacy, and education for mental health and addictive disorders. At Fairwinds, we believe that everybody is on that continuum. We're all there. <laughs> What I am most in awe of, professionally and personally, is Patrick's own journey and his well-documented journey on the New York Times bestseller, A Common Struggle. With great transparency and vulnerability and grace, he shares his story. If you'll please join me in a warm welcome for the Honorable Patrick J. Kennedy. Thank you very much, Tess, and, uh, and thank you, Chris, and to your board of directors. Congratulations to the uh, staff and to the board uh, keeping this incredible organization going strong for so many years and helping so many people here on the island of Nantucket. And, uh, and what a great crowd you have of great support for your mission, and I'm so honored to be with all of you tonight to see uh, you all turn out for such an important resource for this, for this island. Um, uh, I also want to say, uh, uh, in addition to my wife, Amy, who's uh, right here in the front with our baby, uh, Marshall, who's uh, 11 weeks old. Uh, and uh, we figured, you know, they asked me, well, is he, who's he named after? And I said, well, you know, the Thurgood Marshall's son used to work for my dad, and you know, the Marshalls were very friendly. And then, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, history, and of course, General Marshall and the Marshall Plan. I said, if he's about domestic civil rights, he's covered because we say he's, you know, named after Thurgood Marshall. If he wants to go into inter the international arena, then he's named after a George Marshall. So uh, we, we, we've got him covered when he grows up. And a friend of mine who's at Harvard told me recently that uh, George Marshall gave his famous speech about the Marshall Plan at Harvard, and to be sure I mentioned that in 17 years, uh, when Owen is applying to, as an undergraduate for Harvard University. You never know what it'll take to get him in. So uh, uh, in any event, uh, I, uh, I was fortunate enough, I, didn't, I, I wasn't able to uh, have the aptitude to get into any of those uh, Ivy Leagues. In fact, I applied for Brown University and was rejected from Brown. But the irony of all irony is, is after I left Congress, uh, Brown uh, hired me to become a professor in their neuroscience department. <laughs> <laughs> 
of all places, right? <laughs> To, to teach graduate students about, uh, of course, public policy having to do with, uh, with uh, mental health. But um, in any event, I also want to acknowledge uh, my dad's uh, lifelong partner and closest friend and confidant, uh, Vicki, who's here tonight. And she, uh, without Vicki uh, in my dad's life, he would not have been the senator that he ended up becoming, as all of you know, as truly one of the five greatest senators ever to serve this country in the United States Senate. <clears throat> I'd say he was the greatest, but then you wouldn't take anything I'd say from here on out, seriously. But I said he's top five, you know, that, that's reasonable. I mean, he did, he did author more pieces of legislation of consequence, and certainly in the area of social justice, than any other U.S. senator in history. And, uh, and, and it, it's remarkable because he was in the United States Senate for nearly 50 years. And the reason I mention that is that uh, I'm often introduced as uh, the leading voice on mental health and addiction, and that's usually when they can't find Jim Ramstead uh, to fill. And I don't know how many of you know that you share this island in the summertime with one of the real greats in uh, championing the cause of mental health and addiction treatment. Uh, Jim Ramstead was carrying this fight forward on the Republican side uh, long before I got elected to the United States House of Representatives. And uh, so I have to say, not only is it a personal honor for me, because Jim Ramstead was my Republican co-sponsor for the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. Uh, but all of you who care about this cause should know uh, there are people like Jim Ramstead who were in the trenches fighting the good fight for years. And uh, Jim, it's wonderful to see you there uh, ch cheering us all on. And Doris, great to see you. You look terrific. You look terrific. and. Um, can't wait to have you see all the little ones later on. You've, you've got enough to count as it is, but here are a few more that we're adding to the equation. Um, so I, I said that um, I'm often introduced as the leader, and, and I, I kind of say it in jest, but um, it should tell you how bad things are in mental health and addiction that... Uh, that people like Jim and I get to be the sponsors of, of really a groundbreaking piece of legislation uh, called uh, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act, which is really our version of a modern day medical civil rights bill. Because what the parity law that Jim and I uh, worked on together did was basically say you could no longer treat mental health and addiction as separate and unequal to the rest of medicine. And uh, it's not a very revolutionary concept. Uh, but as uh, Jim could tell you, uh, and I can as well, and I did tell you in my book, uh, it took us years before we were able to get this piece of legislation finally to the floor of the House and voted on and then sent over uh, to the Senate. Uh, but before I get there, let me just say that uh, uh, I uh, was first elected in the Rhode Island legislature at the age of 21 as the youngest member of the House of Representatives in Rhode Island. And then I uh, ran for the United States Congress at the age of 27 and was elected as the youngest member of the United States House of Representatives and then elected to uh, Democratic leadership at the age of 31. And I just want all of you to know tonight that none of it had to do with my last name being Kennedy whatsoever. <laughs> <clears throat> it was my good looks and personality uh, that got me elected so many times so early on in life. And, um, but when I got elected as the youngest member of Congress, uh, I was anxious to kind of at least co-sponsor all of the bills that I had been a co-sponsor of in the Rhode Island General Assembly. And it was really shocking to me because in Rhode Island, we had something called parity. And I was sitting next to, ironically, one of the uh, sponsors of Parity. But I was well down on the list of co-sponsors. 
Um, and so I thought when I got to the House of Representatives that out of 435 uh, members um, that, you know, there should be at least, I'd be lucky if I made it in the top 100 list of co-sponsors. And uh, I remember going to the Democratic clerk saying, you know, who, who are the Democratic sponsors and where do I sign on as a co-sponsor? And the Democratic clerk said, uh, well, Congressman Kennedy, if you want to be the lead Democratic sponsor, that bill is all yours. <laughs> and, and this was as the youngest member of Congress from the smallest state in the country <laughs> and in the minority party because uh, our Jim and my good friend Newt Gingrich had just become Speaker of the House. So uh, if that doesn't tell you kind of where mental health and addiction ranks in our body politic nationwide. I don't think anything else that I could tell you now uh, would, because there's nothing like seeing the fact that uh, the person lowest on the totem pole got to be number one on the list of sponsors on the bill. Because usually in Washington, D.C., people fight over the very popular bills. Right, And the only people who get to put their name first are the people who have been around a long time and have a lot of gray hair or no hair at all. They're the ones who are the sponsors of these bills. So it should tell you a lot that, um, that I got to be the sponsor. I don't know what it was about the title of the bill, Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act that scared my colleagues uh, about why they in the world they wouldn't want to like put their names as sponsors. I guess when they introduced the bills, they would figure, well, if I if I introduce the bill, then people are naturally going to ask me, well, have I ever experienced a mental health condition or addiction or anyone in my family? And uh, of course. No politician wants to answer that question because if they say yes, then there's going to be 35 more questions about how treatment turned out and what medications are you on and or something thereabouts. And if they say no, then of course the media will think they're lying. So there's really, they're between a rock and a hard place it turns out that one of the things that I thought was one of the worst things to ever happen to me turned out to be uh, one of the best things, uh, and certainly with respect to this issue. And that is when I was running uh, for state representative, uh, the guy that I had been in drug treatment with at age 17 in Spofford Hall up in New Hampshire uh, decided to sell his story to the National Enquirer uh, for $10,000. And so my face ended up on the cover of the National Enquirer, um, and I thought my whole political career was over, as you naturally think if that happened. Um, this was when I was running for re-election to the State House. And the first thought that came into my mind was, uh, I wonder how I'm going to explain this to all the people that just voted for me to be their state representative, now they'll feel like I let them down, that I, I, I got their support under false pretenses, that, I, that I, I lied to them somehow. Now they'll know who I really am. I'm an addict. I'm no good. They're, they're going to want to dump me. That was my, what's going through my head. And the person I was most worried about, uh, what he thought of me, was a, a fellow by the name of Frank DiPaolo. Um, and Frank DiPaolo was the guy that helped me get elected when I first ran for office in Providence, Rhode Island. Now, if any of you have been to Providence, Rhode Island, you know, at least back in the 80s, it was very Italian-American community, especially in the area that I represented. And uh, so I was running against an Irish guy by the name of Skeffington. And, and his, he was a funeral undertaker. And his slogan was that he was the last guy to let you down. <laughs> and uh, uh, so literally, the way politics worked back then, and I think it probably still does, 
is when we did the polling, you know, literally people who had any Irish heritage would split evenly 50-50 between Kennedy and Skeffington. And what I needed to win the election was I needed the Italo-American community to come out for me. So when I got Frank DiPaolo, who, by the way, owned the largest um, restaurant in the neighborhood uh, to, to support me, I, I knew I was going to win because he was going to bring that Italo-American block and, and put me over the top, which he did. And he used to take me door to door in the neighborhood. He'd knock on the door, and people would come out and say, Frank, how are you? And he'd say, wait just, Irene, a second. You know I have two girls, and I have two boys. Patrick here, he's like my third son. And that's what Frank did for me. 2,600 homes we rang on all those doorbells when I was a Providence College student, and he got me elected. And so, of course, when this National Enquirer story ran, I was terrified that I was going to have you know, shamed Frank, because it wouldn't be not only shame on me, but now the shame would fall on him because he put himself out there for me. So I went over to his house. God's honest truth, you can't make this stuff up. I go over to his house. He's at his stove stirring his pasta fagiol. <laughs> I, I kid you not. He's making his pasta fagiol. He won't turn around, which, of course, is indication number one that I'm in big trouble, right? And so I sat in his little kitchen, and I waited. I, my head was racing. I wondered what, if he's going to reject me. Is he going to yell at me? What's he going to say? And I said, uh, Frank, uh, I think you may have seen the story in the National Enquirer, and he, he you know, about that guy, he wrote, wrote about me, and, and Frank turned around and goes, oh, that rat, and I didn't know what he was talking about. I, I was like thinking, oh, am I a rat? What did, what's wrong with me? I, is that what he calls people he doesn't like? And then he said, that rat bastard, and I, I was just still trying to, my head was dazed. And then I started clicking that he was talking about the guy who sold his story to the National Enquirer and not me. And I'm starting to feel a little bit better. And then he goes, then he turned around. I'll never forget it. He said, buddy, you want me to do something about this? <laughs> And I kid you not, that's exactly what he said. And, and this is the last guy that, you know, he never, you know, it, it was not his style to be flamboyant or to kind of, you know, pose at all, which made this, this request or this, this solicitation very real. Um, I subsequently found out that he used to drive for Raymond Patriarcha. Uh, <laughs> years earlier, something, a tidbit he had kept. So he was unfazed about me being a drug addict. He was like, this is no big deal, Patrick. And then he said to me, he said, he said, we'll win this thing. He said, because the other side, they're on the side of the rat bastards. And I thought, oh my God, at least I'm going to, and of course I won because who wanted to be on the, and then uh, drug addicts aren't popular. But to be the person that rats on a drug addict, that's really a no-no, <laughs> especially in my neighborhood in Providence, Rhode Island. So, uh, so I won that election and went on to get elected to Congress. And then because of that experience, I was able to break the everything in me which said, keep quiet, hide. I was able to put my name on that bill because I was already outed. So Jim is so sweet. He introduces me. He said, you know, if President Kennedy were alive today and were to write another chapter in his book, Profiles and Courage, he'd put Patrick there. And I say, I never chose to be public. And for my fellows who are in 12-step recovery, I never chose um, you know, not to be anonymous because the way this disease talks to you and the way it was in my family, I totally would have kept this thing in the closet. I mean, are you kidding me? I wouldn't have wanted anyone to know. And uh, 
So that is the ultimate irony in all this. And um, God has saved me through this peculiar route of having me chase politics, even though I was the most unlikely of people to go into politics because I was not the gregarious, outspoken person. But I wanted to be in it because I wanted to be closer to my father. You know, most people say they retire from politics to be closer to their families. In my family, you go into politics to be closer to your family. <clears throat> in fact, when I got elected, um, I thought my dad would be so proud of me because, you know, I had arrived, I was so young, I got elected, and so forth. And he just said, no, I'm so happy because now with Joe here and you here, when they say, who's that damn Kennedy think he is, there's only a one in three chance they're talking about me anymore. <laughs> so, uh, uh, you know, but it was uh, really the uh, honor of my life to serve with my uh, late father. And I, the, the incredible narrative that I'll have to cut to the chase for because I'll never sure I don't go off on a tangent and I don't want to miss this. And that is that um, my late father became my champion for parody, even though I grew up in a home where none of us talked about any of this. And I always say the irony of all ironies is the time that we really spoke about mental health and addiction and alcoholism and post-traumatic stress and getting all this stuff covered was in the context of negotiating national legislation to end the discrimination against everyone who was suffering from those illnesses for whom insurance companies would deny them. And in a, in a kind of, uh, in a way, my dad and I were at least broaching the subject that we could never really talk about um, growing up because my father's generation uh, was such that just like his parents' generation where these issues were never discussed. And, and that was the message we got because on top of the silence, the code of silence that anybody from his generation had, you had on top of the fact that we were uh, so well known and people were always prying into our business that there was an even greater um, emphasis not to talk about these things because uh, God forbid they make you look, you know, weak or needy or what have you. And um, so it, it is something that this parody law, in a sense, was uh, allowed me to come full circle with my father and not only work on an incredible piece of legislation, but on a personal level, be able to at least bond with him a little bit on a subject that I don't think he ever got comfortable with it, but he was comfortable talking about it in the context of politics. And I remember before he passed away, he said, you keep going with that work on mental health. Um, it's so important. And it was probably because he was inundated with people saying, you know, God, that Patrick's over there with Jim Ramstead, they're pushing that, that uh, parody bill. And my dad, uh, ended up being the sponsor on the Senate side by default. Uh, and it was uh, really a tragedy. Uh, Paul Wellstone was killed in a plane crash, and my father was the uh, obviously chairman of the committee, so it fell on him to be the sponsor of the bill. And his bill was the conservative bill that the insurance industry really had put forth. And their bill really said that we were only going to cover biologically based disorders, which is really what a lot of state laws did at the time. Um, and our bill, uh, Jim and my, uh, my bill over in the House side, covered all DSM diagnoses. And so can you imagine the chance that, you know, I had to work it out and Jim and I went into a conference committee with my father and Pete Domenici, God rest his soul, who did a great job on behalf of this movement, but who is principally concerned with biologically based disorders because his daughter, uh, Clara, has schizoaffective disorder. And, and he 
I'll never forget it, said, I'll be damned if we let those addicts poison our bill. Because back then, the, uh, the feeling was, let's get, as my father was very good at, let's get something done and not make perfect the enemy of the good. In other words, we've got the insurance industry ready to sign off on a, on a mental health bill. Let's not go and add all of the quote-unquote affective disorders, which include post-traumatic stress, anxiety, depression, alcoholism, all types of addictions, eating disorders, and the like. So um, that was the big fight. And so the Senate passed their bill, was on the desk in the House. Uh, Jim and I passed our bill, thanks to Leader Pelosi, Speaker Pelosi, landed in the Senate. And uh, then 2008, at the end of the session, rolled around, and I knew for a fact, and, and Jim and I both knew it, that if we did not get this bill passed in that cycle, we would have to come back and have it go through all the committees again, because it was referred to Labor Committee, Energy and Commerce Committee, Ways and Means Committee. Believe me, it took a lot to get a bill passed one of those chambers. And so we were find, trying to find a way to pay for this because they said to mandate health insurance coverage would have an impact on the federal um, you know, budget. And so it was roughly about $14 billion. We had to find a tax extender uh, that would uh, compensate for the lost revenue or the increased cost, so, so to speak. So I called my father. He had, had been diagnosed at that time and was uh, receiving treatment for glioblastoma. He was at home, and I said, Dad, can you help me do anything to get this bill off the desk in the Senate? Whenever I needed a bill passed, of course, that was the guy I called, my dad. <laughs> How do I get this passed? So I said, can you help me? And he said, call Chris. And by that, we all knew it it was Chris Dodd, because Chris Dodd was the guy that was subbing for my father on the labor committee. But we also remember Chris Dodd because he was chairman of the banking committee. <laughs> and um, so that fall, so I said to Chris, can you help us? And I was thinking because he's on the labor committee, maybe he can help them move the bill off the desk. Wouldn't you know, a week later, the stock market crashed. The banks start to go belly up, and all of a sudden, the Congress is in a panic, and there was only one thing that we needed to do, and that's try to save our economy from going into another Great Depression. Do any of you remember that time <laughs> at all? And so the proposal was to give people like Jamie Dimon, who got us in the mess in the first place, um, roughly $800 billion of your tax dollars. That was, the, uh, that was the solution. Give all the money to the very Wall Street folks that had gambled through these um, toxic assets because the, there was no other way for us to shore up our credit as a nation. So running through Congress was this bill called the TARP, Toxic Asset Relief Program. Price tag, biggest in history, roughly $800 billion. Chris called me, Patrick, I've got an idea how to pass your Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. I said, tell me. He said, uh, how about I write the whole TARP bill into your and Jim's H.R. 1424, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act. I said, Chris, can you do that? He said, I'm chairman of the committee. I can do that. So you're looking at the two sponsors of not only parity, but of the largest federal bailout <laughs> in our nation's history. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, Vicki was so kind and, and gave me the pen that my dad had after it was signed. And it, and it is, I, I still look at it and I go, is that true? And it's H.R. 1424, our parity bill, Financial Assistance you know, Crisis Relief Act. And you're like, what? And then there's like three subsections down, mental health parity and addiction equity. Like, how do they all fit together? 
but you couldn't make up the fact that a bill designed to stop our country from going into another Great Depression was a bill <laughs> to treat depression. <coughs> and it was signed on, uh, President Bush signed it on the very same desk as President Kennedy signed the original Community Mental Health Act of 1963, in which he called for parity and in which he called for a community-based support uh, based approach, uh, like Fairwitz. Because he, he said in the signing ceremony, John F. Kennedy said, um, that people with intellectual disabilities and mental illnesses, quote, need no longer be alien to our affections or beyond the help of our communities. And that's really powerful because he didn't say, um, beyond the help of our psychiatric hospitals, although we need psychiatrists, beyond the help of our psychologists or our pharmaceutical companies, although we need them. He said communities, because the real answer, which we still haven't figured out in this country, to the crisis of mental illness and addiction is a community-based approach where housing is involved. Who would have known that housing Uh, was such a significant component to people's recovery from both mental illness and addiction. When I bet you if you ask 98, and I'm making it being generous to my colleagues, 98% of the members of the House of Representatives, if they saw being on the HUD committee as significant for mental health, they'd look at you like a deer in the headlights. They would not know what you were talking about. There is not a... Um, appreciation for the fact that uh, community is really made up of supportive employment, supportive housing, early intervention, peer support, all the things that Fairwinds amongst the clinical support that you, you he heard uh, mentioned um, is, is part of it. So, and John F. Kennedy also was right when he said, should no longer be alien to our affections, because that hits it. The, one, the biggest problem we have in our country today is that people with these illnesses are alien to our affections. I mean, let's just be honest. We don't like people when they're suffering from these illnesses. And, and that's a fact. And most people make their judgments about these issues based upon people that they know who suffer from these illnesses. And when you suffer from one of these illnesses, you're not a very fun person to be around. And you're not a very sympathetic person. You don't evoke any, like, oh, compassion. You, you in fact, you know, invite the opposite. Uh, and, and, and that has been reflected in our public policies, and it's been reflected in our budgets, uh, on the federal level especially. Um, how in the world could you say that in the HIV AIDS, and HIV AIDS was very stigmatized, but after HIV and AIDS became a national crisis, we were spending $24 billion a year tackling that. And it was only this year that we moved our funding for the opioid crisis from $500 million to $4 billion. And by the way, everyone's doing a rain dance thinking, isn't that the greatest thing in the world? When that's less than five uh, Five times that is what we were spending on HIV AIDS. So uh, it does tell you a lot that even now with this crisis where we're losing 63, 64,000 lives a year that we know of, uh, of from opioids and, and other addictions, overdoses, and probably another 44,000 from suicides, that we still can't mount any serious public health intervention. Um, because the best reflection of it is in the money, always. Follow the money, show me the money. As Tom Cruise said, show me the money. Guess what? If you said, show me the money on mental health, whether it's research, whether it's treatment, uh, or what have you, always at the bottom of the heap in terms of all health indices. 
But if you look at the cause of disability, mental health addiction always at the top in terms of illnesses and the impact on people and their lives throughout the course of your, their lives, by the way, because these are illnesses that particularly afflict young people and stay with people throughout the course of their lives, unlike many other illnesses which predominantly affect uh, people at the end of their lives. So in every measure, these illnesses should be a national priority for us. And yet, why is it that we're not spending peanuts on this illness when you compare it to what we would spend on other illnesses? And the end result is because we as, as individuals as, uh, and as communities don't like people who suffer from these illnesses because we're identifying the behavior as a character flaw as opposed to a chemistry problem that the person has and for whom the symptom is behavior. Because you see, <clears throat> no one gets up any given day and tries to go around and make an ass out of themselves. Okay, pardon the crudeness. Okay, you don't just get up and say, I'm going to try to make everyone whisper behind my back, um, ridicule me, make fun of me. I'm going to do everything I can today to perhaps get arrested and, uh, you know, really uh, bring shame on my family and friends, um, lose my housing, lose my job. And yet, that's what we're ascribing. We're really saying, oh, but they chose that. Are you serious? I think every single human being wants to be loved, appreciated, embraced, respected. That's innate as a social animal that we are. So when we're not acting that way, we're not healthy. And we need help to get back to where uh, we ought to be and where we belong. And instead, we invite the kind of criticism that, that is easy to level against people who act out in the ways that mental illnesses and addictions uh, have people act out. So um, I, I'm just saying that because it, it really is a sign of our times, too, that we wait till people get really ill and really act out before they go to treatment. You know, I see a day where we treat these illnesses like we would cancer or diabetes or cardiovascular disease, and that is we check people early and we treat them at stage one of their illness, not at stage four of their illness. <clears throat> My wife Amy is on the board of Mental Health America, and Paul Gianfrido, the CEO, has a phrase, before stage four, in Massachusetts, before stage four. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's easy to remember. Now, like, why would we relegate people to go down and have their illness pathologize and get really bad and then blame them for not getting better? Because, you see, we don't ask when you go into the doctor's office, uh, do you have a family history of mental illness? Do you have a family history of addiction? Because they still don't ask that. Uh, and if we, they did, we could get, and by the way, it's not in your EMR, right? And until we have it reflected as part of your overall health, we're not going to be able to respond in the health system in the ways that will prevent someone ending up going down the wrong road because physicians will not know how to better appreciate the risk factors that this person has towards various illnesses in the same way that they would triage risk factors for cardiovascular disease or, or cancers or what have you, and then therefore target appropriate interventions. You see what I'm saying? Like the model for this should be taken from medicine, even though the solution for this is not just medicine only. Um, we all know who, those of us who are in recovery, uh, that we have a, an allergy, physical allergy, a mental obsession, and a spiritual malady, which means, you know, 
in a, and another way of saying is we have a biopsychosocial illness. In order to treat this illness, we need to have the medical system treat the allergy. You know, whatever the inpatient is, whatever the outpatient is, whatever the pharmaceutical is, you need to have that. Then you need the counseling, that's the mental part, and then you need the psychosocial, which is the spiritual part. And you put all of those things together, people have a good chance of surviving these illnesses, and frankly, a great chance of thriving with these illnesses. And the evidence, the literature is replete with if you do these things, people do very well. But what do we do in our country? We don't pay for the full picture. We don't have a systematic approach to treating these illnesses holistically. And it's not beyond our ability to do. So it comes back to the political um, will to treat this illness and the people that suffer from it in the same way as we would any other person suffering from any other illness. And that's why I started off talking ab about how our bill, uh, Jim and my bill, mine, Bill, is, is modeled after a medical civil rights approach because, you know, it's really about treating people, we say in the bill, inpatient, in-network, outpatient, in-network, inpatient, out-of-network, outpatient, out-of-network, pharmacy benefits, emergency room benefits. If you provide it for the primary care, secondary care, tertiary levels of care for cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, you must provide it for diabetes, for, for all kinds of addictions like alcoholism, opiate addiction, eating disorders, what have you. And, and, the, and that has been set up under uh, law, but we're approaching the, the 10th anniversary of the parity law, and I'm sorry to tell you that we haven't made the progress we need to make in really getting payers not just uh, private insurance companies, but also CMS, the federal government's payer, um, to reimburse for treating these illnesses in the way that they would treat any other illness. And uh, we are going to have a, a big celebration to mark the 10th anniversary of the parity law, which is October 3rd. And uh, we're going to launch a Don't Deny Me uh, campaign. We're going to have a parity registry where people can file claims and get assisted, kind of like um, tax, turbo tax. And it's going to be like turbo appeal. So, but we're working on that. We've got a team of lawyers figuring this out, and we're we're working want to work to support people to appeal denials, wrongful denials, by insurance companies of uh, medical um, treatment across all levels of care and amongst those six buckets as required by federal law. Um, and I think that it's going to be better for us as a movement to, to wrap ourselves around the law because I think in general most people don't know a whole lot about addiction and mental illness other than these headlines and these um, stig stigmatized uh, portrayals and media and so forth. I think a law is very simple. Are you discriminating or aren't you? And I think the general public can get behind, well, I'm not sure about the, but they shouldn't be denying treatment. You know, like I think we can use that as our cause, that insurance industry, and we have the evidence, by the way, if anyone's interested, they can go on uh, uh, www.thekennedyforum. So you can't forget the Kennedy Forum. And you can look up Millman Report. Millman is an organization that does all the fancy dancy analytics for all the big insurance companies and healthcare uh, companies. And a friend of mine who's uh, one of his sons has schizoaffective disorder and he's been very successful on Wall Street. He decided to personally pay for Millman to analyze 46 million claims data across the country to show these insurance companies what's really going on. And guess what? Millman, who works for all these insurance companies, came up with that report. It's featured on our Kennedy Forum website. And it shows you all of the disparity. In other words, 
inequality when it comes to accessing treatment for mental illness and addiction as compared to medical and surgical as required under law. So in states where, you know, Blue Cross is the predominant payer or United is the predominant payer or Aetna or Humana or Cigna, you can pretty much surmise that that insurance company is violating the law. And, but we want to put more meat on those bones, okay? So we're going to launch this campaign to get people to register complaints because believe it or not, people still don't want to come forward and say, yes, I too am someone who has suffered from a mental illness addiction and I know what it's like to be denied care and, and in an unjust way. And then what I do politically is you put them in the, because I learned from my dad the best, you put them right in the office of the attorney general in that state. And you, you sit there because the attorney general is elected too. And what, what do we want, Mrs. Attorney General? Well, um, we want to see you because we think uh, the payer in this state and this uh, is discriminating in this way. And, you, and then we give them concrete examples of where the payer was violating the law. Now, rather than have Susie Q file an appeal individually and, and try to stand up against a giant like United, Attorney General, all they have to do is call over to Jim's district in Minnesota where United is headquartered and say, what's going on out there in Minnesota? Um, United, what are you doing? Substituting your own medical management criteria for generally accepted medical management criteria for the disease of addiction, which is, by the way, a big lawsuit's going to come out and hit United so hard between the eyes within the next month called the WIT decision, where they systematically replaced their own medical management criteria for ASAM criteria. That's a Society for Addiction Medicine, which is uh, the standard for, for what things to reimburse for. And United wasn't even adhering to who the experts say are the ways to triage and treat people and what's accept accepted clinical uh, reimbursement for, and so forth. So we need to just ratchet uh, this up because um, in my view, these insurance companies aren't going to squawk because they get someone to sue them. They've already factored in um, the cost that is a cost of doing business, people suing them, right? And by the way, no more than 2% of people who are denied ever appeal. And you can figure out why. It's impossible. You need to be a PhD JD to figure this out. And, and, and most people don't have the time. They're, they're dealing with their loved one who's suffering from the illness. They can't worry about filling out reams and reams of pay. And by the way, they should have been taking notes all along. Every time the facility called and the insurance company called, they ought to be taking co copious notes. How is anybody supposed to do that in order to push back on an appeal? So I think the way to do this is to get the AGs engaged, get the insurance commissioners engaged, which basically says, if you're going to sell insurance in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, you better subject yourself to a good audit of your medical management practices, because it's not enough to say that you do it the same. That's what all of them say. Check the box. Oh, we do it the same. Check that box. No, no, we want to see it in practice. And by the way, with Watson, which is, by the way, in Boston as well, you know, we have a little Watson. Uh, IBM's moved uh, some of their health facilities. We can do all this through an algorithm. We can tell through all claims data across MedSurge BH whether there's more onerous medical management practices placed on a patient seeking help for mental health and addiction than would otherwise be the case for someone seeking care for medical or surgical care. We know this. And so we just got to do it. And, and, and what's held us back is the inertia of, I don't want to step out. You know, I don't want to be known. So the whole idea of the 10th anniversary and don't deny me is we need to create a, a movement there's, we certainly had the silent majority, right? Well, Richard Nixon used to say he had the silent majority. In this case, you know, we had the silent majority, but no one's piping up. And until we get people activated politically, um, we're never going to be able to 
enforce the law and by enforcing the law get more people the coverage that they need. And by the way, at the end of the day, it's gonna be a, a, a savior for the insurance industry because right now they're paying for all kinds of costs that come with a person who is active in mental illness and addiction. And they're, they're all focusing on that top 5% of their spend patient population that, that eats up 50% of their spend. 5% of their population eats up 50% of their budget. And I guarantee you a good percentage of that 5% are people with these comorbidities, with underlying depression, addiction, and who drive up all their other costs, whether they be diabetes or cardiovascular disease or any other complications that come from untreated mental illness. So at the end of the day, the insurance industry should be on the side of treating mental health and addiction more aggressively, not retroactively. They ought to be proactive in all of this. Um, and so we're actually getting some insurance companies are willing to finally uh, come forward with that. But their, their return ROI has to be quarterly. So they really don't have the uh, incentive to double down on helping you stay fit for five years from now because you may be on to, you know, Aetna, you know, next year, and then all their, that hard, those dollars they spent on keeping you healthy and getting you that Fitbit and everything else, getting you those yoga classes and getting you that therapist and blah, blah, blah. It's all going to be for naught because you're going to be healthy and saving their competitors money. They don't want that. So we have to come up with a new um, financial system, and I think we can do it. And we did it in Rhode Island when I was a state rep. We assess all the payers a pro rata basis of their market share, put it in a prevention fund for kids. And all of the payers agreed to it because they all knew that someday those kids were going to be their subscribers. And they weren't putting any one of them at a competitive disadvantage by being assess these fees because all their competitors were assessed the same fee on a per pro rata basis. And I've never understood why we can't do more of that um, going forward. And of course, uh, uh, President Obama uh, has, and through the Obamacare, definitely there are these prevention funds, but that's just been scratching the surface of where we really need to go. And uh, we all know that if my dad had, had uh, lived longer, this is the kind of stuff we would have gotten <laughs> embedded in that ACA, um, and it'd be the kind of stuff that he'd be pushing back on now as the current administration is trying to uh, narrow out these plans. And you know what skinny plans mean? That mean no uh, obstetrical care, no mental health or addiction care, basically nothing that you might need, but you can get the insurance at a really good rate. Um, so that's, uh, we're, we're in the struggle. We're in a struggle. <coughs> anyway, let me just say, I think I've, I've well gone past. Oh, my God, someone should have given me the high sign. Um, I am uh, so honored to be with all of you. I hope that for those of you who are interested in this movement, um, you do go on the Kennedy Forum, um, dot org and you look at our parity registry because we're going to be uh, feeding that going forward. We have Parity Track. That's a state-by-state -state report card on how each state's doing against Parity. Um, and we're going to have we're going to move towards employers next year as well to start a push to get employers to do more in terms of their EAPs, because right now employers do nothing on behalf of their employees. Nothing. And there's uh, scant evidence that there's a handful that are doing something, but it's still anemic compared to what employers should be doing this day and age. So if you're interested in this movement and want to be uh, tracking it, um, please, please follow us. <coughs> and, and keep giving to Fairwinds. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Patrick. I would like to introduce our next speaker, who is Kate Brosnan, co-founder of the Nantucket Project. Kate has been a passionate Nantucket resident for the last 35 years. Her commitment to the island is demonstrated by her significant participation on several boards, including uh, 
Big Brothers Big Sister, ASAP, and then Nantucket Comedy Festival. Uh, Kate was the executive director of Juice Guys Care, the philanthropic arm of the Nantucket <coughs> Nectars. She also served as general manager and host of Emmy Award winning Plum TV Nantucket. She has a, uh, a deep love and knowledge of the island, having lived here for so long and having raised her two children here. Kate Rosen. Lots of pillows. Woo! Are you having a hard time with those pillows? <coughs> Patrick, it was so um, interesting and wonderful to hear, especially about policy and, and change um, and how we as a country deal with mental health and addiction. But there's also, I think, for me, I, I think of it as so the stigma you know, that maybe we can, God willing, get the, the, the government behind it, but how do we as individuals um, break <coughs> the stigma and those feelings? I, I just think, and I'll tell a personal story, my father died of alcoholism, you know, and we never discussed it. Right. Um, my mother, if somebody, if she knew that somebody had a drinking problem, you know, that was... She would go, oh, you know them. And I'd be like, what does that mean, you know? Uh, so even, you know, within my family, there was definitely that stigma of um, what it means to be addicted. Yeah. So in your own personal story, and I think as, as recovering, a uh, recovering person, how do you get to that place where you let go of your own stigma and shame? I, I, it was so funny because I was the champion with Jim, with parody, but I still was active in my addiction, and I was going to treatment. I went to chose Mayo Clinic rather than Hazleton because I thought if I went to Mayo, then they might think something was seriously wrong with me. <laughs> uh, if uh, they found out I was at Hazleton, then they know I was a, an addict and I was in trouble again. So, uh, you know, I, I was hiding. I remember going into detox off of opioids because, uh, of course, this was before PDMPs, prescription drug monitoring programs. I had doctors writing for me everywhere in Washington and Rhode Island, southeastern Massachusetts. Um, so I had, uh, and of course, I was able to justify that because uh, it wasn't like I was putting a needle in my arm, right? even though the drug is the same as heroin. And uh, so the layers of denial are so great. Um, they say about addiction and mental illness, the, the single greatest characteristic of it is the lack of insight. The inability to tell how bad you really are. And when I wrote my book, um, I was surprised to find out how many people like absolutely were like, you were in such big trouble, but they never told me about it. And frankly, a lot of them in the mental health field. Um, so it, it, it's just interesting when Jim and I, uh, we passed the bill, when I, when I got back from rehab uh, a number of times, but the, the really big time, this was after I was in a DWI and I thought my political career was over um, I came back to Washington and I kept my head down. I was like, how am I going to get through this? And I kept having colleagues of mine ask me to come talk to them. And that usually meant that we were going to sponsor a bill together. Or we're going to work together or they needed my help because I was on the appropriations committee. Right? You know, they needed my help. Invariably, they, what they really wanted to tell me is that they had a problem too. And it was amazing because Members of Congress that I never knew before stopped me and asked me to have lunch with them, to sit down with them. And I'd bring my staff, and they'd always say, you know, can we have no staff here? And uh, they would tell their own stories. And I remember uh, one of my colleagues telling me that um, his daughter had been hospitalized repeatedly for an eating disorder, and he was always worried about whether she was going to survive. And he felt so bad because the demands in Congress are so overwhelming. And she felt 
you know, bad having this problem, this illness, uh, because of the impact on him. And then when the vote came for parity, he voted no. And I went, you know, I never, all these colleagues of mine, and Jim's had the same experience, we all kept their confidence. I, I, I saw this uh, colleague of mine later on. I said, how could you have voted no, given the fact that this was so personal to you? And he said, that's exactly the reason I couldn't vote yes. Because um, first of all, Patrick, I come from the buckle of the Bible Belt. And in my area of the country, they still look at these as uh, moral failings, not medical issues. And they look at them as character flaws, not chemistry issues. And, and then he said to me, if I voted yes, then the press would write about it. And then they'd try to figure out why I voted yes. And then someone might snoop around and find out that my daughter was treated for an eating disorder, and I can't be sure if she'd survive that. That's what my colleague, one of my colleagues said to me, meaning she might take her life if, if that shame was brought on her of being outed because of a, her father's vote. So this has, this stigma thing is enormous. Um, and, um, and, and, and it was enormous for me too. I, I, even though I was the sponsor of the bill, I kept trying to you know, keep it quiet. And of course, I was the last one to know I had such a big problem. Right. And how do you, in the 12-step <coughs> program, one of the spiritual foundations is anonymity, right? So in, um, how do you wrestle with coming out? Because I think that helps people. I mean, I often wonder if, you know, Alcoholics Anonymous was started today, if that would be. Right. Um, considering what we're looking at in terms right. of the epidemic that we're, we're dealing with. I mean, everybody on this island knows how many young people we're losing um, and how many suicides and all. I wonder how uh, Bill and Bob would feel right. today. Um, but do you, does, was it a point um, for you that you said, oh, do I come out or do I stay in? Can I work more productively by not being branded as an alcoholic or having um, a mental illness. What was that dilemma like for you? Or what, because you were out it publicly? Yes, you... so I had the first thing with the National Enquirer I told you about. And then, um, uh, hey, honey. Because <laughs> uh, maybe he wants to come uh, sit with you. <laughs> so, and then I, then I had, I was all over the news because of my uh, DWI. <coughs> um, so I, again, I had no, I was outed, outed. Like, right. and I, the beautiful thing about being outed is that everywhere I went, someone in recovery knew who I was. Right. Not Patrick Kennedy, they knew I was an alcoholic, right? right? right. I was one of them, right? And in that the tribe. now, like, but none of them knew who the other ones were, right? right? So I could go everywhere. And I'd find people approach me and take me aside. I never forget going back and campaigning and my staff saying, listen, Patrick, don't talk about being in rehab. They've heard it. They've read about it. They're un it's enough. Talk about what you're doing for the Navy on Aquidneck Island, right? Talk about the Meals on Wheels program, so forth. And I said, um, and of course, I would get to my community event. I'd say, first of all, let me thank you all for all those great get well cards that you sent me while I was in rehab. <laughs> And all the senior citizens would be like, Mary, did you send him a get well card? <laughs> oh, Martha, did no, Susie, did you? And they didn't know because they wanted to be my friend, right? They couldn't stand the thought that maybe they le were left out of the love that, that the, their, their friends were showing me. Uh, and so there's a, there's a nice flip on this stigma. We can open it right up. I mean, those of us, when we're, connected to the sunlight of the spirit, I mean, life couldn't get better. And um, so I, I'm lucky. I have a very, uh, I have a great uh, group, trudgers. We meet five days a week, and we like to trudge the road of happy destiny. And it's the same people I've been in recovery with uh, for over seven and a half years. And uh, I picked a hard date, and I've stuck to it. And every uh, year that my anniversary comes around, Jim sends me one of his old anniversary coins. 
So Jim's like, he, he's got, he's like in his 50 years sobriety or something ridiculous. And he's now has to go back to his bin and find his <laughs> like, let me see, four years, five years, <laughs> six years, seven. I'll send Patrick that one. Um, but uh, the, these people are like the foundation of my life. I mean, uh, I can see just where they sit every morning. Mm. And uh, so, and it is the greatest thing that's ever happened to me. I never put much stock into 12-step recovery because I was always worried. There were a lot of staff people on the Hill when I was, uh, uh, and, I was and when I was back in Rhode Island, God, I was thinking, God, if I say anything that I really need to say, someone will find out. Right. So um, now it doesn't matter if they find out because I'm not in office anymore. Thankfully, yeah. No, but seriously, it's like 12-step recovery is, is the best. And I understand, I still have an anonymity, even though you see me amongst my group, I'm not in there as Congressman Kennedy, author of parody, blah, blah, blah. I'm just there. And because they see me every day, all day, every year, all year, it's no, like they're really looking at me. Right. Another bozo on the bus, right? Another bozo on the bus, <laughs> yeah. So, um, To me, it's interesting that the statistics are that one <coughs> out of four people suffer from mental illness and addiction. And so that means when you, and then you think about the families that suffer, yeah. um, that why haven't we seen uh, a movement like the breast cancer movement, a movement like the AIDS movement. Is it the stigma that's holding us, do you think, back? Because it seems that we're, I mean, every day um, we're losing young people, um, our parents, our loved ones, uh, whether it's through suicide, OD, um, and yet we, we can't quite get it off the ground to really discuss it and to get that energy behind it as we did with breast cancer and the um, AIDS epidemic. Well, I am for a checkup from the neck up for every physician's visit everywhere in the country. So it doesn't matter if you're going to the gynecologist or the pediatrician or the geriatrician. I just think we need to normalize treatment for mental health. And as I said, if we get in this early, we're not going to be so hyped up because we're hyped up now because people are really ill and it scares the living daylights out of us, right? We're scared of falling off that cliff ourselves because we don't want to lose agency. That's what that means is we don't want to lose our minds. It's the most precious thing we have. Nothing else matters. And um, because if you got your cognitive abilities, you're, you can make it through anything. But if you're diminished in that way because of a mental illness or a neurodegenerative disorder, you are, there's nothing more important. And I would say just the A's, Alzheimer's, autism, addiction, that's, we're just starting with A's, right? The burden of these illnesses is so immense that it's shocking to me as a nation that we're not all in to discover how to better treat this organ of the brain, how to better maximize and organize all the things that need to be done to help us cope with stress, deal with stress, um, solve uh, you know, biological genetic problems that may come up as a result of our heritage. It's just shocking to me, JFK took us to outer space, that we're not in a race to inner space in this day and age. I think it needs to be about saving our country. I, I think we need to float a savings bond program like we did during World War II. And we need to say, if we spend the dollars today, we're gonna save Medicare and Medicaid, our health system, and God forbid all of our personal lives, enormous tragedy. Tomorrow, if we do a crash kind of Manhattan project on the brain, and, and that's how we can work with our colleagues around the world, which we're already doing amongst the neuroscience community, starting to, I mean, that should be exciting to us. We could all sign up and be part of an ongoing research so that our kids can live better lives from the lessons learned through the life that we live. 
it just seems to me this is so much in our self-interest. And we are, as a nation, guided by self-interest. I mean, am I wrong? Like, we are all about (laughs) self-interest, right? That is is our gospel (laughs) as a nation. So if our gospel is self, why in the world would we not do everything? You walk by in the airport, every self-help book you can imagine. How to be a better CEO, a better manager, how to be this, every magazine, how to tighten up this, how to look better here, <laughs> letter back. Why aren't we working on the thing that can make us the best of the best, which is how to better live our lives and live to our full capability and optimal um, capacity? Now, th- the military does this, and it's not stigmatized. Green Berets say that mental health is a force multiplier. I want a force multiplier. You know, I'm an addict. Give me something that's going to give me, give me a little me force multiplying. Good. Yeah. <laughs> so I would say that I think we need to reframe this in the kind of positive. Like, everybody's got challenges. Why wouldn't we all be in it to try to maximize our individual and collective ability to meet those challenges. And it's, that's why I say it's brain health. I think it's remarkable. You look at the funding at NIH, it's abysmal in terms of neuroscience. With the burden of illnesses and, and neurodegenerative disorders alone, take aside uh, suicide, addiction, NIDA, National Institutes of Mental Health, it is scandalous in this great country that we're not spending more on these illnesses. And it's a direct result of the lack of political pressure that constituencies do not um, call out their members of Congress, that we're living in a situation. So we need to borrow what other great movements do, and that is we need to get organized. We need to do all the things that they do and mobilize and, uh, and have an agenda you know, uh, for a force multiplier agenda. How much responsibility does the pharmaceutical uh, companies <coughs> have? I mean, you know, the stories that I hear from young people are, you know, I broke a leg, I got 30 uh, oxys, um, I liked it, I got 30 more oxys. Um, next thing I knew, heroin, fentanyl, because it was cheaper. And yet, we're not holding that, the medical community. And they sold it as it was non-addictive. Yeah. Um, and, and now this, <coughs> this epidemic has happened. And how do we, as a society, point the finger back into that community and say, you know, you are killing people with these? I mean. So the pharma has a lot of uh, responsibility, but, you know, the fact of the matter is they, uh, they, they ginned it up. They, they sold it to the medical societies. They, they lobbied CMS. They got CMS to, you know, calibrate their reimbursement for hospitals based upon the satisfaction of patient satisfaction, which, of course, played right into our hands as addicts because if we gave a thumbs down, that would, that would hit the, the uh, reimbursement rates for these hospitals. So everything was calibrated to drive um, more use of a very addictive substance. And they also hid the literature right. about how addictive. If you've never read the book Dreamland, it's a great story about how both Purdue Pharma on one side and and uh, heroin cartel in Mexico on the other hand, kind of both of these came to meet and create the crisis that we're in. Um, But I would say, take this opportunity to say, I think what we're doing right now, repeating that mistake, the new Purdue Pharma is big marijuana, Mm. in my view. Um, I think it's an addictive substance. And we say, well, it's not as bad as opioids. Is that it? Is that your best response? Um, Well, we don't like the fact that minorities get arrested. Well, guess what? More minorities are getting arrested in Colorado today than before legalization. So the two best arguments are off the table. And, um, and now what you basically have is a corporate enterprise of selling an addictive substance that is targeting young people. 
And by the way, we all know anxiety and depression is skyrocketing amongst kids because of their use of technology and their inability to kind of seek coping mechanisms and social emotional learning and all the things that we know uh, Fairwinds and others provide. So what are they going to do if it's ubiquitous and everyone's saying, well, it's medical and you can vape it and you can eat it and there's edibles, there's little gummy bears with THC in it. And by the way, you can drink it. It's elixirs. It's like Red Bull with THC in it. I mean, we're not talking smoking a doobie, okay? <laughs> we're talking about industry-driven, commercialized drug that is 10 times stronger than the, the Woodstock weed of 30 years ago. So, and we're letting this happen now while we're all saying, oh, Purdue Pharma, they're so awful. And, you know, they have a lot to bear, you know. We're going to repeat that Purdue Pharma, mark my words, five years from now when marijuana is claiming more and more kids' lives across the country, not in the dramatic way necessarily of them dying, but just taking them out of life. Uh, I think we're in for a real uh, shocker. And I am surprised we're not having more uh, political leaders stand up to this. And I'm, and I'm also shocked that on the Democratic side, they probably won't find it, uh, uh, anything but a handful of Democratic um, uh, leaders who are going to say that this is a bad thing for our public health. We have totally, as a nation, been sold on this. And uh, I think we're going to really regret the day. And my dad always said it. <clears throat> my dad always said, and they, well, it's not as bad as alcohol. Well, yeah, yeah, you're right. I think we ought to do more to re regulate alcohol. <laughs> um, and, and by the way, we can't regulate alcohol because the alcohol liquor industry is so bloody powerful. They have six lobbyists for every member of Congress and every member of the General Assembly on Beacon Hill. So if you think that that's bad, then what chance do we have to regulate this new substance? We're not going to have much. The public health is going to get run over like it did with alcohol. Um, but, but, you know, it's like, what kind of future do we want for our country? That's what we should be asking ourselves. And my dad said to me, if you're going to be up and people are going to listen to you, say something. So I took your question about, you know, stigma, and I put my own two cents in there about marijuana, even though it's a controversial it's, issue. It's, and they probably don't want me talking about it fair winds because... Uh, uh, you know, Patrick, we're going to have to wrap it up. But, I, you know, if you could leave with the message of, and, and I'd love to hear this um, more on a personal note, because I think you took risks by, even though you were out, it, this book takes a lot of risks. It doesn't only talk about your own <coughs> personal story. It talks about the stories of your family, yes. um, the losses in your family, yeah. the silence and stigma in your family, and opened that up to the world. And I know that you got positive and negative feedback. Yes. But by doing that, I mean, I think, I think it takes great courage because it also normalizes that all of our families are pretty much the same, at least the Irish Catholic ones. <laughs> I mean, it was exactly like my family. Um, what would you say is the most important message for families or people um, that are hiding their own, um, that they're silencing that, that, the shame around it, that they're afraid to ask for help, that they, you know, they just don't know how to stop, right? I mean, we know that it's not, you don't pick it up by choice, you know. What yeah. is it? The man takes a drink, the drink takes a drink, and then the drink takes the man. And I think that understanding that it's um, once that train leaves the station, um, you're just along for a horrible, rocky road. But what would you say in order to, to anybody in this audience that loves someone, knows someone, and why it's important that we take all of our skeletons out of the closet um, to help this movement and to save lives, basically. Well, I understand for people how difficult it is because even with these employee assistance programs and people needing help, they don't want to signal to anyone because they're worried about losing their job. They're worried about losing their housing. They're worried about losing 
if you know, and of course with family, with kids, you don't want your kid to get a scarlet letter. Oh, that kid's got a, you know, IEP and so forth. We're this is a wholesale change. There's, there's no doing this in little bits. Right. It's got to be a wholesale whole change. revamp. And I think as a nation, we've just, uh, you know, so I've said that I've been living in denial about my illness. My job in therapy is to try to keep track to at least to some extent as to how much insight I have to my own situation and how much am I like off on a track where I have no concept of where I am and any, fortunately, that's the, the job that we all have. And I would say that we have to make it a priority for our, for our own lives, our families' lives, and, and for this country. I, I really feel like, uh, you know, I, I outline the very legal and political movement because I like to keep it, you know, I don't want it to be mushy, right? I, and, and, and I, Give us some mushy. Okay, so... <laughs> Um, so, you know, I, I chose my, my sobriety date was my dad's birthday. I, I felt I was so still in uh, such distress over his loss, uh, and my addiction, but I, but I'm not an addict because of anything that happened to me in my life. You know, my, my, it was bio, it was genetic. I feel, you know, my grandmother on my mom's side died at 61 and wasn't found for a week. We never talked about it in my family. I don't know where she's buried. I don't met my grandfather once on my other side. Never had my mom talk to me. One sentence about her parents. Okay. Most I've learned, I've learned through my cousins on my mom's side. Um, so, and on the shame and trauma, my aunt Rosemary, uh, back in the day, she got a lobotomy, not because of her intellectual disability, but because of her psychiatric disorder and people don't know that and you know it because there can be co-occurring you can have both an intellectual disability and a psychiatric illness and the shame in that in my father's family the silence just pervaded so that it's passed down and I know I'm going to pass it down to my kids too implicitly without even knowing about it I'm going to make them feel like ooh, ooh that's uncomfortable don't talk about that <laughs> so I have all my, uh, my work is cut out for me to try to make sure I'm proactive with my kids and get them to feel comfortable in themselves and that where they can express their emotions and feel safe and feel heard and feel like I'm present for them and I'm looking at them and not at my cell phone. And um, so, you know, the mushiness for me is that I, I, did not drink on that uh, anniversary of my dad's birthday back in 2011. And my wife thought I would go out on a bender. And I didn't. I kept going to these meetings, the Trudgers meetings, where, where we were living in Epsic in New Jersey. And, um, and it was just one day at a time. I mean, it's so trite, but it was just one day at a time. I could never have envisioned, you know, seven and a half years ago when I – left Washington, D.C., left my job, left Rhode Island, was living in South Jersey in Atlantic City, Oof. and asking myself, what in the world happened to me? I could never envision, you know, seven and a half years, fast forward, that I would have been appointed by President Trump to be on his uh, opioid task force with Governor Christie, Governor Baker, Governor Cooper, and a professor from Harvard, Bertha Madras. Never would have imagined that I was able to get the parity uh, stuff into the recommendations that we had for the president, albeit none of them have been followed, no surprise. But it stands for something, because now when we do have a president that wants a cheat sheet for what to do, I was able to contribute to that, right? But my point is, I never could have envisioned any of that happening. Um, and, you know, I, so I just, uh, I can't tell you how every day is a surprise. Uh, just cannot begin to tell you what a surprise it is. Um, 
I mean, I got a call just two days ago from Warbur Pincus, and they want to talk to me about their big investment strategy and behavioral health. <laughs> I'm like, what? Who is Warbur <laughs> Pincus, and what do they need? I'm just saying, like, I was curled up in a ball, you know, former member of Congress, you know, nobody returning my calls, miserable, couldn't put two days together. You know, my wife, to her credit, said she wouldn't have anything to do with me unless I went to 12-step recovery and put some time together. And, and I was 50-50 between doing recovery and, frankly, moving to Australia. I kid you not, uh, Vicky knows I have an accountant, Keith, and I asked Keith if he could transfer, you know, my dad's estate over to Australia because I had this notion that I'd be like Neville shoots on the beach. Uh, I'd like live the rest of my days waiting for the apocalypse and, you know, literally living just out of my mind. That was like a legitimate choice that I was considering. And now I got this incredible woman who's like my partner and who encourages me through sobriety. All these five kids, all God bless, they're all healthy. And, and I'm able to be present for them. I have a roadmap for living. I know how to deal with all my anxieties, depressions, compulsions. I've got all this support around me. I've got these people in recovery who've been through what I've been through and can offer me guidance. It's like, I, honest to God, I just uh, I can't believe it. And so all I would say is to the f folks who are out there who have loved ones who are suffering, it's hard to imagine how it can get it, it, it gets better. And it's hard to imagine fast forward three years. You want it to all happen right away. And it doesn't happen right away. But it does happen over time. Patrick, it, it reminded me, um, you know, it, to not leave before the miracle happens, and, and yeah. you're really an example Thank of that, you. Patrick. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Patrick, I want to thank you so much for your candid feedback Thanks. of your journey, as well as uh, your family history. And Kate, thank you so much for the beautiful job interviewing this evening. It was fabulous. I also want to thank the board and advisory <coughs> board at Fairwinds who stand behind me and the entire team daily and show up for the great work that we do. We also couldn't be in here without our fabulous sponsors. Thank you so much for being part of that. And then lastly, I just want to point out two key members on my team who made this entire night possible, Paul Keishan and Hannah Montgomery of Fairwinds. And, and to every single staff member on the Fairwinds team, we are stronger together and you make meaningful changes in people's lives and it is a joy to work with each and every one of you. I also want to thank everybody in the audience today who showed up because this conversation matters to our community. What Patrick shared was what's going to happen nationally over the next couple of time and how we need to continue this good fight. We need to lower the stigma and recognize we're all human and we have valuable problems that are treatable and that hope does happen and to wait for the miracle. There are pledge cards within your program this evening. And if this conversation matters to you and you'd like to have a tangible way to give back to the community and <coughs> offer support for our sliding fee free services, I thank you in advance for your consideration. All of the funds that raised here stay here on Nantucket. And thank you for being part of this movement. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you.